Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering InterConnect 2017. Brought to you by IBM. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live here at the Mandalay Bay for exclusive CUBE three-day coverage of IBM InterConnect 2017. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante for all three days. We're on day three, winding down, great show. Our next guest is Justin Youngblood, VP of Hybrid Cloud Management with IBM. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me, great, great to, to be have, here. Great to have you on because uh, you know, a lot of the talk obviously cloud, we hit blockchain, you know, but a lot of under the hood production workload stuff still needs to manage with all this stuff. You guys had an announcement on day one um, on the auto, cloud automation management a big part of the keynote. So it was kind of a prime time spot. Can you share as why, how, well, how, why did you get that great slot? <laughs> how did you get the great slot? And why, <laughs> what's the impact? Well, it really all starts with what's happening in the market. And the team's been working hard inside of IBM. We announced IBM Cloud Automation Manager. It was elevated to a tier one offering, very strategic space for IBM in multi-cloud management. Um, what we know is, every enterprise is now moving towards multi-cloud environments. Cloud adoption is, is well into yeah. its maturity, and, and really it's 71% of enterprises have three or more clouds, and they need yeah. to manage those clouds with a common management platform, and that's what cloud automation is And it's a big pain point about. too. I mean, it's one of those non-sexy items like blockchain. It's like off AI and blockchain hit the headlines, but a lot of the blocking and tackling is going on in hybrid right now, so you see that orchestration piece between multi-cloud Little things like latency, security, workload migration. I mean, this is what you guys are doing, bringing the IT operations to a modern level. Is that kind that, of the main thing? That's exactly right. And there are really two entry points to this because on the one hand, it is that IT team, right? When you think of the modern enterprise, every modern enterprise is trying to move faster, trying to get applications out faster, trying to better engage with their customers, essentially trying to digitally transform, be the disruptor instead of the di disrupted. And, and often they'll look at their IT team and say, you know, you're not keeping up, you're too slow, right? So this is an automation and orchestration tool that allows the IT teams to rapidly deploy applications and infrastructure to the line of business and to their DevOps teams. Well, that's the thing, I mean, you got developers, not just IT, you got the developers and the line of business who have a financial stakeholder, the top line revenue, Absolutely. right, to make it happen, and you got the movement to true private cloud happening. What's different now for you guys with automation? What's the key, um, unique thing in this announcement that makes it go to the next level? Yeah, there's several things there, but, but you know, no solution is complete from IBM these days without cognitive, right? <laughs> and so bringing in those cognitive services and insights to analyze and help optimize the performance of workloads on any cloud environment, and also really to provide an advisor role, prescriptive guidance and recommendations on where to place workloads to optimize performance, cost, compliance, right, within company policy and security and regulatory environments. So we had uh, Mohamed Farouk on earlier and, and he was talking about um, cloud brokerage services. And I wonder, as you enter this market, if you're starting to see different KPIs emerge, right? The traditional IT operations KPIs, okay, the, the light on the server's on, you know, it's uptime, planned downtime, unplanned downtime, you know, percentage of my backups that, that failed, whatever it is. Are there new KPIs emerging as people become cloud brokers? Yeah, absolutely, and, and Mohammed's a good friend. We're both Austinites, right, in the yeah. same building. Another <laughs> Austinite. Austin's <laughs> dominating the cube this week. We, we talk regularly, <laughs> and, and really we see a nice synergy between the cloud brokerage tool, which is brokering across the you know, application readiness assessments of putting workloads onto the cloud and then planning and cost analysis and so on, and then the orchestration of actually deploying those workloads. And so there's a nice synergy. And then really the third leg of the stool in my mind then plays into service management. And having the integration across all those pieces is really important. So being both cloud agnostic for multi-cloud environments, but then also having an open API and ecosystem that you can enable and plug in with existing tools. And there was a period of time where IT was almost afraid of automation, but then this cloud thing sweeps over them. Are we past that now? We are past that, and, and it's a great point, right? Because sometimes IT can be afraid of automation because they can think, that's threatening my job, right? But we've got client success stories where we're running our cloud orchestration and hybrid cloud management solutions at massive scale, literally saving dozens of full-time equivalent hours. And what we're finding is these enterprises are saying, 
finally, now I can get to the innovation and the transform, transformative projects that are on the strategic agenda rather than working within you know, manual IT processes. So it's been, really been a win-win. And when you talk about that average stat, the average enterprise has, you said three, three clouds? Three I or mean, more clouds, 71% of enterprises I, I, have three or more. I mean, are you excluding SaaS in that number? We're excluding SaaS because yeah. you okay. think about right. private clouds. So that's clouds. infrastructure clouds, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely, private clouds, public clouds, and a lot of departmental <clears throat> clouds or shadow IT where different cloud services are being consumed even if the IT team may not be managing it. So, then, so that brings the question in, where does SaaS play if I'm a cloud broker and I've got these corporate edicts and I've got these KPIs around you know, running the business and transforming the business? Do, how do I apply those edicts to SaaS, and can you help me do that? Is that futures, or is that just sort of a separate island? Yeah, it, it's a little bit futures right now. Mm -hmm. Many times with, these, with the cloud management platforms in particular, um, these tools are used to automate the deployment of the infrastructure, and what's unique in our solution is the full stack application and even the day two operations, but the SaaS applications are tending to come in through a slightly different channel now. Over time, I think what we're going to see is all applications, whether they're delivered by the IT team or from the cloud, need to come into a common And should CIOs platform. be worried about that because you know, each SaaS provider has different infrastructure, you know, some of the different availability profiles, different definitions, different SLAs. I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother problem area to be attacked, I guess. Yeah, no, it, it is a concern. I mean, the, just the application sprawl, right? Infrastructure sprawl. Cloud sprawl, and th mm -hmm. this is why you know I think any any time we're entering into a new industry, we're going to see that expanse and then back to a convergence. And and honestly, um, I presented with with Dave Bartoletti from Forrester this week, and and a lot of his insights and things that he writes about, and what I spoke about, and my team did in our sessions was the need for a common management platform because of that sprawl. It's raining in the chaos. What are some of your favorite examples? You know, customer case study, early early wins. Yeah, so a, a great case study is at Swiss Re, right? Large global insurance company, 60 global offices. This is a company that uses um, our cloud orchestrator solution with business process manager. Their environment includes WebSphere, but also Microsoft Active Directory, ServiceNow, Puppet, et cetera. Um, when they, they came and used our solution to really to automate the deployment of applications, to put, put applications and IT as a service into a self-service catalog for their line of business and development users, at the end of the day, they, they have automated 45,000 processes executed each month and, and literally dozens of offerings into the service catalog now. So the IT service management business has been evolving very rapidly. Cloud has impacted that. The on-premise ratios are going to probably shift a little bit, but not radically. But then again, the use cases for public cloud are going to be dependent upon the workload, right? So that's, that's, right. that's kind of well defined and discussed. Question I have for you is, um, from a customer standpoint, the number one conversation we're having, and we're seeing uh, digitally at least on Twitter and, and in theCUBE is, what does enterprise readiness mean? So I'm an enterprise and I want to go to the cloud. I have to then evaluate which cloud is best for which workload, but then I also have to put it through the prism of readiness, their table stakes, do they have the table stakes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, I mean Google's got some great machine learning, but the SLAs might not match up, or Amazon's got some great kinesis for analytics, but I can't run my other thing on that. Yeah. That comes up a readiness problem. It, it is a readiness, and I would say there is no single cloud that is purpose built for all workloads, right? And a lot of the messages you heard here at Interconnect this week, even from Jenny Rometty herself, were IBM has the enterprise ready cloud. And a lot, of, a lot of data points to back that up, including every enterprise is going to be cognitive. And the way we think about that is cloud and cognitive are two sides of the same coin, a famous quote also from Jenny. Um, but now we're getting into trusted networks and hyperledger and blockchain. I don't want to get too far off track, but it's, it's some but of they'll augment the change on the disruption side, on the innovation side, not necessarily impact some of the blocking and tackling table stakes. The blocking and tackling. So that gets down to some of the regulatory concerns and other yeah. pieces, which is why we've invested now to have 51 data centers around the world because yeah. of data locality yeah, and yeah. security concerns that, that companies have. So there's, there's a lot to Well, that. I love her line. She's the best, I got to say. Very memorable. Enterprise strong. Maybe I got the whole Boston strong thing that's still in my head because being <laughs> from that area. Enterprise strong, data first, cognitive at the core. I mean, those are the three pillars. You can unpack that in every different way. So you guys have to bring that into your offering. So I get the enterprise strong, 
data first. How are you guys using the cognitive piece specifically uh, in, in this? So data first, is that an architectural thing? And then where's the cognitive piece fit in? Yeah, perfect. So, so as we architected this solution, it was really important to us to put cognitive at the core. And, and really two use cases primarily. The first is around, as companies go, deploying their applications and workloads on the cloud, every application is going to have its, its downtimes, its slowdowns, its outages, and that impacts end user experience. That's why it matters. It can, it can impact revenue or NPS scores for the company. So the first is a cognitive operations capability. And, and you can think of that analytics moving from Log, log analytics to quickly pinpoint the root cause of issues up through predictive analytics to prevent an outage or an issue before it impacts your, your end users, ultimately into the cognitive domain, which is a, a true machine learning and, and the, the capabilities that we're working on in our labs now and that we demonstrated this week at Interconnect, we actually have a chat ops interface for the IT operator to come and interact with a cognitive system that's part of Cloud Automation Manager and get prescriptive guidance and confidence levels It'll be around voice activated the next Watson, course of basically action. in the future. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do move to Cloud Nine. Um, so that's the differentiation, right? I mean, if I were push, to push you on that, it's trust. I mean, everybody's going to say they have cloud, but you know, like you said, it's a multi-cloud world. And it's the cognitive piece, is that right? It's really the trust and the cognitive piece. The, the cognitive piece is absolutely the number one piece of differentiation that no one has. Because a lot of big enterprise hardware and software companies are going to say, you trust us. People do trust them. That's, I mean, right. that's how they got to be multi-billion dollar companies. But talk a little bit more about the differentiation with respect to cognitive. Yeah, so, so that, that's one aspect of it. And that's just cognitive operations management, right? And even that, um, is at one level of value. Where I think there's additional value is getting into really letting Watson and, and cognitive services become a, an advisor to your business. So imagine your smartest IT operator in the business, if Watson can learn from that person, right, Sally or Jeff, whoever it is, learn from that and help every IT operator in your business always make the best decision as, as smart as the smartest subject matter expert is in IT operations. And, we, and so this is the learning aspect of cognitive and, and in that advisor role now, all of a sudden, a cognitive chat ops interface can begin to provide prescriptive guidance with, when there's an outage. Or, or imagine an application or workload going down and Watson taking automatic action to redeploy the workload on a different cloud that's not, that has not been impacted, no interruption of service to the end user, and then, and then come back and say, now let's pinpoint the root cause of the problem and fix that, but I've already addressed the main point, so you're... And what's key about that is it's a learning machine model, so you have the domain expertise of the specific use cases. It's not trying to use some sort of vocabulary and map that onto an infrastructure environment or a software environment. Very plain language, natural language understanding, and yeah, and it's it's really, really powerful capability. All right, so the question is, how do customers get um, access to this? Um, Blue Mix Garage, is there IBM.com, and what's the vehicles for getting this in the hands of, of customers? Yeah, the, the easiest way is at IBM.biz forward slash try IBM cam. So if you go there, it'll take you right into our, our Blue Mix service and customers can get started right away. We have a free edition that allows customers to get started with the offer. All right, I know this is a, a tough personal question, I'll, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> no one likes to pick their best, who their favorite child is, but what's most exciting about the product from your standpoint? Looking at the success of the announcement, obviously prime time on the keynote, uh, congratulations. But Thank it, you. What's yeah. the, what's the, What's the, un, uh, what's the one thing that you get most excited about the product? Yeah, the, the, the most exciting, exciting thing is it's all about the application, right? It's all about the application and digital transformation. So certainly the cognitive piece, and we've talked about that, but I want to highlight one other thing, which is we and IBM are providing pre-built automation content from the infrastructure up through full stack applications and getting into the day two operations, the monitoring, the backup, et cetera. We can orchestrate that end to end unlike anyone in, in, in the industry. So end to end is a key word. This is end. now a big part of the architecture. End to end cross vendor. Exactly. And open source. Yep. That's kind of the big. That, that that's what you call automation packs? Is that these, right? are the, these are the cloud automation packs, exactly. In the past we called them patterns, we're moving to an open pattern okay. technology base and we call okay. them cloud automation packs. We're right. gonna, we're, and I'll just say more about that. We're going to make them available in a marketplace 
in the IBM cloud marketplace so clients can come, learn about, discover, try, and buy these automation All right, packs. so here's the hard question for you. Um, well, it might be easy for you, hard for me, but as you go end-to-end, -end, which is totally the right way, I believe, that's the way everyone wants end-to-end, -end, right. you, but you're crossing horizontal and vertical at specialty across multiple vendors and new things coming. So now 5G comes enables autonomous vehicles, now you got smart cities, now you got Watson trying to learn that's new right. environments that I've never seen before in IT. How do you guys prepare for that? What are you guys doing to get out in front of that next wave? Yeah, so, so in the past I think a lot, of, a lot of applications and even management tools have been built as monolithic applications. With, with the Cloud Automation Manager, we built it from the ground up. It's cloud native, microservices based, just like a lot of applications out there in the <laughs> enterprise are being run. That allows us to be much more composable and flexible than we've ever been in the past. And we augment that with a set of open APIs to integrate with client's existing tools. You heard me mention the example of integrating with ServiceNow. Of course, we can integrate with Urban Code or other DevOps tools, APM and monitoring tools, et cetera. That's the key, integration is the, is the new table state. That is the new table state. Justin Youngblood, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great, congratulations on the success of your launch and good luck with the adoption. We'll see you out in the marketplace. Great. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Justin, the VP of Thank you. Cloud Management inside theCUBE. More cloud action, more data action, more predictive content here on theCUBE. More great interviews coming. Stay with us. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>